Let me first acknowledge some uh, celebrations in the congregation. A very happy birthday, Judy. Where are? Where is Judy Weinberg? Where is she? Oh, she just walked in. Perfect timing. And Frida, wonderful, wonderful to see you and to celebrate with you this morning. A very special birthday to both of you. Many, many more in good health, surrounded with love. We have a very special speaker uh, coming in two weeks. A very interesting guy. His name is Dor Shachar. Uh, that is not the name he was born with. He is uh, originally from Gaza, was born in Khan Yunus, the same city as Yahya Sinwar and his buddies, uh, the heads of Hamas. And he's on tour, speaking in synagogues across North America. And a couple of weeks ago, my colleague from Los Angeles called me and said, you've got to have this guy. He's phenomenal. He doesn't speak English. He only speaks Hebrew. Uh, but I'll be here translating. He's going to be uh, explaining what it is like to grow up, the real life of growing up in Gaza. Uh, give us a sense of the enemy that Israel is fighting against. And maybe talk a little bit about his own spiritual journey. He ended up converting to Judaism and he now lives in Israel. So, I don't know if you've heard of Son of Hamas, but this is like Son of Hamas on steroids, who, who completely became a member of the Jewish people. And I hope it's going to be really interesting. So please join me uh, in the sanctuary that's on the 13th, Shabbat of the 13th. I prepared a sermon today. It was about uh, tzitzit, which is at the end of the, which is at the end of the Parsha. But I decided I don't want to give the sermon. I'm going to do something else. I mean, let's talk about the Parsha. As I was reading it yesterday and today, thinking deeply about it, it made a big impact on me, this Parsha. So I don't have anything written down. I'm just going to share these thoughts with you about the Parsha. I do have my watch here in case I go too long. You watch me. Just say what I do to you all the time, right? <laughs> and do this if I go, if I go too long. And I'll try and keep it uh, concise and informative. I want to talk about the Parsha because I think this is a really important story in the Torah and also a really important story to review today. There are two great sins in the Torah. You know that. The major, major sin of the Torah, the sin of the golden calf. This is the second great sin, the sin of the spies. The sin of the golden calf, sort of obvious, right? I don't need to explain that too much. Moses came down the mountain and found a bunch of people worshiping a golden cow. It's, it's pretty clear. The actual nature of the sin in Parshat Shlach, which you might even be able to argue is the more serious of the two sins, according to rabbinic commentary, all the calamities and tragedies that happen to the Jewish people throughout the generations that come after all emanate from the sin of the spies. Tisha B'Av, sin of the spies. Expulsion from Spain, sin of the spies. Holocaust, sin of the spies. So given all the weight that tradition places on the gravity of this sin, what is it that actually went wrong? This is a this is a sin that is much more difficult to understand and to pinpoint the exact nature of the crime than the story of the golden calf. So maybe let's review it together. Moses, actually God tells Moses, you send the spies. Then Moses appoints the 12 leaders from each of the tribes, tells them to go Latur et aretz, go scout out the land. Scout is probably a better word than spy. 
And Moses gives them instructions. Tell me what kind of country it is. Are the people there strong or weak? Few or many? Is the country good or bad? Are the towns open or fortified? Is the soil rich or poor? Is it wooded or not? And bring back some of the fruit of the land. So Moses is asking for details and just wants to know the truth. He doesn't say, you better come back with a good report. If it's good, tell me. If it's bad, tell me. We're nervous. Here we are wandering in the wilderness. We don't know what this destination is going to look like. Give us the truth. They come back after touring the land, scouting the land for 40 days. And the first thing they say, and it seems like everybody is on the same page, the famous line, this land is Eretz Zavat Chalav Udvash. This is a land flowing with milk and honey. And these are its fruit. You know the famous Kedem wine, the big, big grapes. Look at this beautiful land. The people who inhabit it are powerful. The cities are fortified. Is that the sin that they say that the people who live there are powerful? I mean, Moses says, tell us about the people. Caleb says, with Joshua, we can do it. We can conquer it. Let's gain possession of it. For surely we can overcome it. The other ten, as you know, are the problem. The other ten say, we can't attack this people. They're stronger than we are. Is that the sin? And some people say, yes, that's the sin. What kind of sin is that? It seems like just an observation. They're bigger than we are, and we don't think we can attack them. Maybe the sin is a lack of faith in God. A lot of commentaries will say that. With God on your side, everything is possible. But then why did Moses say, tell us what the land was going to be like? Moses should have said, why do we have to go scout the place in the first place? In the first place, God said he'll have our back and we have to have faith. And what do we need to go see it for anyway? And why would Moses even give the opening to the scouts to even come back with a bad report? What's the sin? Maybe the sin is what happens next. What happens next? Vayotziu dibata aretz asher toru ota. These ten people then start spreading disparaging comments among the people about the land. It's not enough that they told Moses what they saw and that they feared conquering this place. It's that they then, behind Moses' back, went into the camp and spread malicious disparaging statements about what the land was like. What do they say about the land? Eretz ochelet yoshveha hi. The disparaging statements are identified in the Torah. The Torah says very clearly what they said. It is a land which devours its inhabitants. Friends, what does that mean? What does that mean? A land that devours its inhabitants. If this is the sin, we better understand what that sin is. What is the nature of it? A land that devours its inhabitants. You can think about it. To me, it means this place is a scary place. Uh, Egypt was tranquil, calm, the Nile River, lots of fields. This place is rough. Remember, they went up through the Negev. Any of you have ever been to the Negev before? It's scary. Cliffs, rocks, a lot of places that don't look hospitable to human settlement. Maybe they mean, this is not a place we can live in. Maybe taking care of this land 
is too difficult for us weak slaves. Now that's possible because right after they say it's a land that it devours its inhabitants, they say, Kol Everybody we saw there was huge, big, strong people. They can inhabit this land. They're tougher than we are. They can deal with its rough terrain, with its fields that are in need of tending, difficult tending, but not us. We're scrawny, weak, pathetic, freed slaves. We can't do it. Maybe that's what it means, a land which devours its inhabitants. And the reason why the sin was so grave is because they could not see themselves as having the inner strength or even the potential to grow into people that could take care of a land of their own. They couldn't see their own physical abilities. Maybe that's the sin. Rashi has a whole other take to what those words, Eretz Ochelet Yoshveha, he means. And this take I want us to pay attention to. Very, this brought out a lot of emotion in me when I read the Rashi's, the Rashi explanation. Eretz Ochelet Yoshveya. This land devours its inhabitants. Those words put everybody in a panic and lead to take us back to Egypt. We don't want to go to this place. Rashi says, this is a cute midrash that you learn when you're younger. I don't know if any of you know this midrash. Rashi says, when the scouts went into the land, God made a sort of miracle happen. He caused a plague to happen across the country and young people would die. And therefore, all of the people would be tending to the funerals of these young people and they wouldn't notice the scouts wandering around. God was trying to protect the scouts and therefore cause this plague caused everybody to be busy taking care of those funerals and the scouts were able for 40 days to see the whole land and nobody even noticed them. At first glance it's a cute story but understand what Rashi is trying to say, the deeper point. I think there's two major lessons here. The first or the obvious one those two spies, Caleb and Joshua, looked at all the funerals that they noticed around the land, Eretz Ochelet Yoshveha. This land was devouring its inhabitants. But understood in their mind that this must be God acting miraculously. And God was looking after us, making sure the people were busy with their own dead and wouldn't notice us wandering through the land. The other ten saw the exact same thing, but could not see the hand of God orchestrating those events to their benefit. And therefore, look at a land actually devouring its inhabitants, a land that is causing young people to die. They see the same thing, but one interprets it favorably, one interprets it to, its, to their detriment. This is the first lesson, and we learn it over and over and over again. Two people can see the exact same thing and twist the interpretation of those events whichever way they want. If you want to tell me that Trump won the debate on Thursday, you can, you can have your facts, you can convince me. If you want to tell me Biden won the debate, you have your facts, you can convince me too. Just pick the quotes that you want to use, 
Choose the facts that you want to state. We are living in a world, unfortunately, that is uh, very aware, I hope, of the tendency that we have to see events but interpret them completely differently based on usually seeing what we want to see and not what we're actually seeing. This is lesson number one of Rashi's comment. It's not the one that gripped me emotionally. It's the second lesson of Rashi's comment that gripped me more. A land that devours its inhabitants, Rashi says that means they all saw young people dying. And I paused on that idea and I remembered several months ago being at Har Herzl Cemetery. And if you've been to Har Herzl Military Cemetery outside of Jerusalem, you walk along the roads and what do you see? You don't know the names, but the ages pop out at you. 17, 18, 19 years old, particularly in the new sections which have been reserved for fighters who have died in the war since October the 7th. I spend my time, folks, at Benjamin's and Steele's and Pardes Shalom and Pardes Chaim. And it's not that I don't see young people die. It's that it's very rare and not common, thank God, all that much. And when you, uh, when you have a case like that, it's jarring. Israel today, and maybe since its founding, is a country that is much more used to being an Eretz Ochelet Yoshveha, a land where young people die, than we are, particularly now. And you read these words and how Caleb and Joshua reacted and how the other ten reacted. And for the first time in my life, I read this story and felt empathy for the ten scouts. They look at a land where young people die and say, we don't want to go into this land. When I meet people and ask them about Aliyah, would they ever make Aliyah to Israel? One of, sometimes one of the frequent responses I receive is, I could never send my children to the army. That's why I can't make Aliyah. You heard that before, maybe some of you have felt that before. Great country, love it, visit whatever I want, but I can't live in a land where young people are dying. Is it so crazy that these 10 spies basically said what so many of us say all the time about why we don't live in Israel? We can't be in a country where young people are dying. I felt empathy for Joshua, for, for uh, the 10 other spies, and you know that we get the idea of a minion from these 10. A minion of ten is because these ten spies caused a lot of trouble with their malicious rumors. So ten people can have a great deal of influence. And even though I felt empathy for them, I know that they are wrong. If we want to have the attitude that we're not willing to fight for the land that is ours, for the land that was promised to us. If we want to be like those ten spies, we can empathize with them, but we know that if we actually listen to them, we will end up back in Egypt. Caleb and Joshua, they were right. We saw young people dying in this land. We don't know why, but we know that that's what's going to happen if we live there. 
We're going to have to defend this country. We're going to have to send young people out to war. We're going to lose some of them. But it is better to live free than it is to be in bondage in a country that is not ours. This is at the heart of this story, and I hope you see why it's so important to read it and why it needs to resonate with us particularly today. We in the diaspora are many thousands of kilometers away from the reality of Israel today. And with every passing day, we are further and further away from October the 7th. And if I could empathize with the ten spies before, I could certainly empathize with them even more now. I am tired of having to defend our right to defend our country. I am tired of this war. I am tired of seeing all the young people on both sides die. I am tired of living in a city where there are encampments on our college campuses, where our young people here don't feel safe, where we have to have rallies all the time, where we have to see the anger and ferocity of our fellow Canadians and keep debating this issue over and over and over again. Am I crazy? Do you also feel similarly? We're Canadians. We just want peace and quiet and neighborliness and what has happened within the Jewish community since October the 7th we've been activated thanks God thank God but it is exhausting and when some people say we just want it to end I empathize with them they are the ten spies just we don't want to continue in this direction but then you go to Israel. Daniel just came back from Israel. Is the feeling the same in that country? I would offer not at all. And anybody here who has recently been to Israel will tell you that what our experience is, is so different from what Israelis are feeling today. Yes, they're exhausted. Yes, they don't want to keep fighting this war. The difference is they know they must. That they have no choice. That they have to see this war through to its end or they are in Egypt. Or they will not have the freedom that they need to live lives in safety and security and be in that land that flows with milk and honey. Israelis today are the Caleb's and Joshua's of the Bible. They are the ones who see Eretz Ochelet Yoshveha. They're looking at a land that is devouring its inhabitants, but they say, Na a le, let us go up there. This is our land. We need to fight for its safety and its security. And Israelis are frustrated that the rest of the world does not see things the same way that they do. Every once in a while I see on my Twitter feed the um, Israeli exterior ministry releasing new footage from October the 7th. Every week, here's a new video that we found of a family being murdered or of a um, maybe a, an imprisoned Hamas inmate that explains what he did on that day. Why every week are they releasing this footage? They're trying to wake the world up to what it is that Israel is facing. Look at what happened on October the 7th. Why do you all not remember? Why don't you know like we know that this is a war worth fighting to its conclusion. Why are you losing the energy that we seem to have so firmly, and in Israel it is universal, left, right, 
and center. It is rare to meet anyone from any part of the country that wants to see this war end prematurely. Helen, I hope it's okay that I do this, but Helen sent me an email that her grandson wrote uh, a few days ago when he came back. Do I have permission, your permission so I can blame you if he gets upset? Her grandson, Ryan, was who, by the way, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to send to Israel after October the 7th, just got back from Israel and wrote this about psychological whiplash, living in New York and then spending time in Israel and going back to New York. And if you know Ryan Daniels, you know a fair-minded person. I'm reading Ryan's email because he's not an extremist in any sense. You agree? Good. Almost universally, Israelis feel this war is just and necessary. It's important to remember October 7th because it's the reason this war is happening is a common refrain. Israelis are astonished that the world doesn't feel this too. But the truth is, the more time that passes since October and that I'm away from Israel, the less I connect with this. The dissonance I wrote about back in March between how the world feels versus how Israel feels is getting even harsher. It is psychological whiplash. Over the last few months in New York, I have felt despair and exhaustion over the IDF in Gaza, the headlines, public reactions to the headlines, the fate of Jews and Israel, enough already was a constant thought. I wished Israelis could see what we see, how callous and brutal the ongoing war looks to the world. But then, like magic, I land in Israel. I see how uniquely good and kind and human Israelis are. And each morning, the person I was in America burns off a bit more. I still feel despair, but I speak with Israelis who are also despairing. They don't want this war either but they throw up their hands. What choice do they have? And I begin to feel deeply that they are right. Ryan, in a much more eloquent way than I've done, I think explains the psychological, through this prism of psychological whiplash, what it is like being here in Toronto, in North America, and why our experience here is so different than it is for Israelis. And I am trying desperately with our community to connect us to what Israelis are feeling because they want me to do that. That's why I'm bringing Dor Shachar in a couple of weeks. So we can see up close with our own eyes on this bima what they see when they're sending their children out to die for their homeland. Because for them, Caleb and Joshua saying, Na'ale, let's do it, we can do it. That is their inner drive. That is a voice that they know is right and fitting and necessary for this time. There is no doubt about it. Whereas for us, we go back and forth. We listen to those ten spies and I hope, like me, you hear them. A land where children have to die. Our children, their children. Is it worth it? I hope that this Parsha, you know, the Parsha sometimes speaks to us. That's why I love studying Torah. It speaks to us strangely, deeply to the circumstances that we are going through currently in remarkable ways. And you just get blown away by the way the Torah is renewed in every generation. And I hope that reading this story in the light of how Rashi understands it, Israel is still today Eretz Ochelet Yoshveha, reading a story about a land that sadly still devours its inhabitants. 
I hope that rereading it energizes our pride, admiration, respect for the people of Israel who are sending their children to war for a land they know is worth fighting and dying for. Because it is the land flowing with milk and honey. Everyone agrees. But we have a right to live free in that land flowing with milk and honey. And freedom, as we all know, comes at a cost. May we have the strength, the endurance, and the faith to withstand all the tests that we're going through now here and now there so that we will have a land that is safe and secure and happy and with all of our hostages return home to their families. Amen. Amen.